Okay, Revelation 5 is where we're at. I haven't been here for a while, but I'm excited. I like Revelation. So, Revelation chapter 5. Let's pray before we get started. Um, Father, um, your word is, is just awesome. And Lord, going through a, a prophetic book like Revelation is um, not only fun in the, in the sense that we're reading things that are really cool, um, as far as just reading them uh, on the face of it. But Lord, uh, the book of Revelation just refers to so many things in the Old Testament, so many things that are prophecies uh, about you and your coming and why you came and, and all of that, Lord. And every, every verse, every phrase is just pregnant with meaning. And, and Lord, as we're going through uh, the book today, uh, we pray that you'd have your hand on us. Uh, Lord, that you'd help me to be clear in my teaching and uh, Father, that the, that the time that we spend here uh, would cause us to do exactly the same thing that the 24 elders and uh, the four living beasts are doing at the end of the, at the, end of the book, just the, the chapter, just praising you and honoring you for what you've done for us. And so we just give you uh, the night and the study and pray that you bless it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last time we were in Revelation, we, uh, we just got done with Revelation 4. I spent like three weeks in Revelation 4. I'm going to try to do Revelation 5 in just a week so that we can get into the gnarly stuff that cha starts in chapter 6. Um, anyway, um, the location is the throne room of God. There's a door standing open in heaven in, in chapter 4 in verse 1. John hears a loud voice that was like a trumpet saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately he was in the spirit. It says in verse two, and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And so John uh, is having this, this vision. Um, it looks like the guy's been transported to heaven in the vision, at, at least in the vision, if not um, for real. And he's viewing things in the throne room of God. Uh, the first things that, it, that he saw, Revelation chapter 4, were uh, there's a description of the throne. There's a description of the thrones that are around the throne. There's a description of the 24 elders. There's the sea of glass, all these cool things in there. And again, it ends up with praise at the end of chapter 4. In chapter 5, what we're going to have is the introdu introduction of the seven-sealed scroll. And that becomes important when we get to chapter 6. When you read in chapter 6, the first seal was open, the second seal was open, the third seal was open. We're talking about a scroll that was in the hand of, uh, that, that is in the hand of the Lamb. And the Lamb is Jesus. And we'll see that as we're going through. Um, but you guys know what a scroll is. Uh, they had books uh, at the time that the book of Revelation was written. Um, they used to say that yeah. Have you guys heard the term codex? Yeah, codex just means book. It's one of those things that's just a fancy term for a book. And so um, when, you're, when you talk about a codex in ancient manuscripts, you're talking about book form. And so they had codexes, but the, but the vast majority of writings were written in scrolls. And you guys know what a scroll is, right? And so they, um, they sometimes wrote on one side of a scroll if they were really rich. If they weren't really rich, they, they wrote on both sides of scrolls. And they would roll these things up and they would put them in, you know, they had, uh, when they had a library, they were just basically little, you know, little cubicles that they would put these scrolls in. Or uh, if, you're, if you're talking about uh, synagogues, a lot of times they, had what was, they have what's called an ark and they would put the scroll in a protective cover and put it in what's called uh, an ark. And so it's just a cabinet. In any case, that's what we have in this passage. If you have a King James Version, it says book. It's not actually book in Greek, it's scroll. And so it says, and I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, 
which are the seven spirits of God and sent out into all the world or into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And then I look and, looked and heard the voice of, the, of many angels around the throne, uh, the living creatures and the elders, the number, and a number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in, the, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Look at chapter six, verse one. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And I did that last part because I, wanted, I want you to have some continu continuity there. The seventh sealed scroll is really important because it's what opens up the, the rest of the prophecy of the book of Revelation. As Jesus the Lamb is taking and breaking those seals on the seven sealed scroll, what happens is there, there's this vision that basically pops out of the book. It comes leaping out of, of the whole thing. That's the, that's the picture that I get. He sees a vision of a guy riding on a white horse and having a bow and all that stuff. And it goes, like, goes on like that all the way through chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. So the seven-sealed scroll is important for that. But it's also important in, the, in this passage because you have uh, John weeping over it. So it's important enough that when... It is stated in the passage that no one can open the scroll or no one can even look at it. It's important enough that John is weeping over this whole thing. And there's all kinds of ideas on um, what, the, what the scroll is. And um, I'm just going to give you what I think it is because I don't really care about all the rest of those. I think what I think it is is probably what it is. So there you go. Anyway, and if you want to search out other things on that, you can do that. I'm just going to give you my opinion on this. Number one, um, as we're going through the, the, through the passage, it, it talks about the, seven, the, the fact that it has seven seals. And basically the way that that, that, that would work is actually one of two ways. Um, when you, you know that when you take and roll up a scroll, it's like rolling up toilet paper, whatever. Um, when you roll up a, uh, I should use paper towels. <laughs> so when you roll up a scroll, you have an end uh, that would be flapping there. And a lot of times what they would do is take and put seals on that. A seal, we're not used to this, a seal is um, basically wax. And so back in the days before they had the sticky stuff on the envelopes, they would take and drip, take a candle, drip wax on an envelope, and then they'd take a, like a, usually a signet ring or something like that, and they'd put a little stamp in it, and that was a seal. You sealed an envelope that way. Well, they did the same thing with scrolls. And so in this case, um, one way that they might seal it is they take and drip seven places where there would be wax on it. And so there would be seven seals on that outside flap of the scroll. So it may be talking about that. Or another way that they sealed scrolls is um, basically when you when you were reading a scroll, you're unrolling it as you're reading it. And so kind of like chapter divisions and, and that kind of thing, you would, you would unroll the scroll, you would break the seal on the outside you would unroll it until you got to the next seal that was dripped inside the scroll. And when you got to the next one, you would break that seal and then open the scroll up more and read more. So it's one of those two ways uh, that, that you're speaking about. Important documents were always sealed. And so Augustus, uh, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Vespasian's wills were sealed with seven seals. And again, this one is important enough that um, when the scroll uh, is found not to be able to be looked upon, John weeps about the whole thing. It's important enough that the 24 elders um, end up in praise when it's found that the Lamb of God 
can open the scroll. It's important enough that literally all of heaven and all of earth and everything that are, that's under the sea at the end of the chapter are uh, erupting in praise. And the, the praise goes to the worthiness of the lamb to open the seal, or to open the scroll. And so you got this scroll, everybody's, you know, John's all wigged out because nobody can open it. And when the lamb can open it, everybody's praising the lamb because he's worthy to open it. And so there's some kind of worth that's attached to the one who can open the scroll. And the reason I'm telling you this stuff is not just because it's in the text. It, it kind of helps you to identify what's being spoken about when you're talking about this scroll. And when you look at the praise that's given um, to Jesus uh, because of his ability to open the scroll, it says, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, number one, because you were slain. So your worthiness to open the scroll comes from being the one who died, okay? The, the second thing that they say is that you've redeemed us to God by your blood. So he's worthy to open the scroll because he died and because he redeemed us. He paid for us. That's what redeemed means. It means you, you paid for us. And then it says, um, and... Uh, uh, you redeemed us to God, verse 9 again, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And in verse 10 it says, and have made us kings and priests. So we're made kings and priests. And I know there, that there's a translational thing. How many of you have an NIV in there in, uh, in this passage? You'll notice the word men in there. You have redeemed men. That's not in the Greek. Um, there's, there's a question as to whether it's us or them in this passage. And I'm not going to get into the whole textual thing with you. You just need to know that there are differences of, of, of opinion on what the right reading is there. And the, um, I believe that the reading behind the King James Version is ancient. And it's actually more ancient than some of the more modern versions. And so I go with what it says in this passage. You made us kings and priests. And so this dying of the lamb and this redeeming has made us kings and priests. And then the other thing that you have in the, in the passage as we're going through and looking at this is that there was only one who was able to open the scroll. And um, uh, when, when you look at the statement, uh, for example, in verse 3, no one in heaven. Who's in heaven? Are you talking about David? Are you talking about Isaiah? Are you talking about Elijah? You're talking about John the Baptist? You're talking about, there's all these people who are in heaven. You're talking about God the Father? You're talking about the Holy Spirit? You're talking about a lot of people in, he, you know, people in heaven. All the angels are in heaven, and no one in heaven is found worthy to open the scroll and, uh, and to loose its seals. It says, no one on the earth Lots of people on the earth. Lots of people who are good. Lots of people who are honorable, honorable. Lots of people who are kind. No one on the earth is found worthy to open the scroll. No one under the earth. It's the idea of no one who's in heaven, no one who's on the earth right now, no one who's ever died um, is able to open the scroll except for one. And the one is Jesus. And we already read the qualifications. Because he was slain and because he's the redeemer. Is, is, is what you have in the passage. Um, so when you're talking about the one who is able to open the scroll, he's called the Redeemer. Um, he's someone who's a sacrifice to God. Um, you see that um, down in verse 6. It says, I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. And that's talking about a sacrifice. When you, slay, uh, when you uh, slayed a lamb, uh, what you were doing um, in biblical speak is you were sacrificing the lamb. And again, obviously, all of this stuff points to Jesus and points to Jesus' sacrifice for us. And then again, at the very end of the chapter, what you have is all the, all the creatures in creation. Look at verse 13. 
and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. So all of creation is erupting into praise because of the worthiness of the lamb to open this scroll. And so that kind of identifies what the scroll is all about. It has to do with redemption. And I think that it's what's called the scroll of redemption. Now, um, you, have, you have these laws in the Old Testament, and I've, I've covered these things a number of different times, and I'm going to cover it again. I know that some of you have been around for a while, and, and, and you've heard this, but there are people here who have never heard this, and it really is important. There are whole sections in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament law, that talk about the laws of redemption. And one of the things that you have when you get to the New Testament is the, the fact that the redemption that we have in Jesus is based on that stuff. God set up rules for being made right with him. And again, the word redemption means to be bought, to be uh, literally bought out of slavery, to be bought out of hawk too. And so there, when, when you were going to be redeemed, um, there were conditions that had to be met for your redemption, and the conditions would be written on a scroll. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty interesting thing. And this is what I mean by that. Um, in the Old Testament, in Old Testament times, God had uh, a way to take care of poor people. And so the general way to take care of poor people was that when you went out and you uh, harvested your crops, you made sure that like if you're doing uh, wheat or if you're doing barley or something like that, you wouldn't harvest the corners of your fields. And the reason that you didn't do that is so poor people could come in and they could harvest the corners of the fields. You didn't harvest all of your fields and then take part of it and take it down to the food bank. What you did was you harvested all of your field except for the corners so that anyone who was hungry could come in and work and actually get some food for themselves. The food was free, but they had to work for it, right? And then you had the same thing with, uh, with orchards. And so they would have... Uh, they would have olive orchards, and uh, the Middle East is like Southern California, and so they would have citrus orch orchards and, and that kind of, kind of thing. There were all kinds of trees that you could eat from, and you were only allowed, according to the Old Testament law, to go through the fields once, or go, to the, go through the orchard once. And so they'd go through the orchard, and they'd pick everything that was ripe, and everything that wasn't ripe, they left on the tree. And the reason that they did that was so that poor people, there would be fruit left on the trees, poor people could come through, and once again, they didn't pick everything off the trees and take it down to the food bank. They, they left it on the trees, and anybody who was poor could come in and grab the fruit off the trees, and they could eat from that fruit. And so that was kind of the welfare system. And so you could make sure, you always ate in Israel. There was nobody who went, who went hungry in Israel um, if they would get up and go out into the fields. Um, the other thing that would happen is when they went into the land of Israel, the land was divvied up for each one of the families of all of the Israelis who went at, in after the Exodus. Okay, and so they go in, Joshua's going in, they go into the land of Canaan, and what they do is they draw lots on the land of Canaan. And so they divvied up into certain portions and so a portion went to each one of the tribes. And so you had a portion that was for, Ru for Reuben. You had a portion that was for Manasseh. You had a portion that was for Judah. And that's the kingdom of Judah when you read about it in the Old Testament. A portion that was for Benjamin and so on. For all, um, actually, 12 of the tribes. And I don't want to get into that. When they're divvying up land, there are 13 tribes. When they're talking about the nation of Israel, there are 12 tribes. Uh, the reason there are 13 when they're divvying, it, divvying up land is because Levi didn't get any land to themselves. And so there, there's a whole thing that goes on there. And if you want more on that, you can come up and ask me. And so when you're talking about the 12 tribes of Israel, you'll see different lists in the Bible. And sometimes Levi is mentioned and sometimes Levi isn't mentioned depending on what's going on. And it has to do with some, some other cool things. In, in, in any case, they divvied up the land, they gave it to the families, and it stayed in the families forever. And so what, um, basically, what would happen is you could sell your land, um, but you only sold it for 50 years. And every 50 years, all of the land reverted back into the original owner's names. And it was because it was God's land, God was giving it, leasing it, basically, uh, loaning it to the people of Israel, and he gave it to specific families. 
And so if you got, if you got yourself in financial straits, you could sell your land. But you knew that after 50 years, it was going to revert back to you and to your family, which is kind of a cool situation. And so any, any land sales were only 50-year sales. When you're talking about land out in the, out in the um, outside of the cities, you could sell houses. Um, so there are uh, a number of different ways that you could take care of yourself if you came into financial straits. And so you could go in the fields and you could always eat. Um, if you needed more money, you could sell your land or you could lease, basically you're leasing your land uh, to whoever, whoever's going to take it for 50 years. And if you were still starving, if you were still having a real problem, you could sell yourself. And this is where the idea, uh, have you guys heard of indentured servanthood? Uh, in the United States, when people came over to the United States, one of the things that would happen is they would get a free ticket to come to the United States uh, coming from England or, or, or um, Europe or whatever, they would get a free ticket to come to the United States if they agreed to be an indentured servant for seven years. And where that came from was the Bible. It, it's it, it's one, of the, one of the rules that you have in the Old Testament. So if you got yourself into financial straits, you could sell yourself. And that would last for seven years or to what's called the... the, um, uh, the uh, day of Jubilee, or the feast of, uh, the, yeah, the day of Jubilee, that's the 50-year mark, but um, you could sell yourself for seven years. And after the seven years, uh, during that seven-year time, you're working for somebody, they're, they're paying you wages, but you have to stay at their house, they're taking care of you, they're feeding you, you're working, that kind of stuff, and when you got done, at the end of the seven years, you would get wages and you would go off and, and that kind of thing. So, here I am. I've got myself in all kinds of problems financially. I lease out my land, and I don't have that, and say I'm only 10 years into the 50-year period. I'm not getting the land back for 40 years. There's no farming for Steve, okay? Um, maybe I'm going out and I'm, I'm harvesting things from crops around and that kind of stuff, going to the corners of the fields, but my family's still having a hard time or I'm still having a hard time and I just can't keep up or whatever. And so I could opt to become somebody's servant for seven years. And, then, and so I do that. And so when I become that person's servant, I have to serve for seven years unless I can redeem myself. And that means to buy myself out of slavery. And so if I can redeem myself, if I come up with an inheritance or whatever, I can pay, the, I can pay my master for the, for the lost um, labor that he's gonna get. Say I'm three years into it. I could pay him for my four years of lost labor and I would be able to go free. I would have redeemed myself. If I can't redeem myself, there are other options. And the other options are I can have a family member redeem me. So I can go to my brother and go, you know what, Chris, I got myself in all kinds of problems here. Chris is my bro actual brother's name. I got myself in all kinds of problems here, and, and so would you redeem me? And he would say either yes or no. And if he said no, and he had the money, then I could spit in his face. This is in the Bible. Right? You were supposed to redeem your brother. And so if, I said, if he said no, I could spit in his face. And uh, there's a little ceremony that, go, that goes on in the book of Ruth that is a reference to that. She doesn't actually spit in anybody's face because they've changed the ceremony somewhat. But that ceremony is based on, on uh, the, the fact that you have this in, in the Old Testament. And so he would have to redeem me. Um, if he couldn't redeem me, if he goes, you know what, Steve, I'd really love to you, but I'm in the same problem you're in, then I would have to go to my next nearest relative. And so that could be a sister. I could go to my sisters. If they didn't have the ability, that I could go to an uncle or I could go to an aunt. And if they didn't have an ability, I'd go to my grandma. I could go to my great-grandma, my great-grandpa, somebody in my family. And if anybody in my family had the ability to redeem me and I wanted to be redeemed, then they would have to do that. That includes not only me, but it can include my land too. I want to redeem my land. Will you, will, will you help me? And so your family was supposed to help you. And I think that that's, that's pretty cool. I think that's a, that's a cool system. I think we should have more of that in the United States. In any case, the conditions that had to be met to be redeemed um, were written on a scroll. You know, the, basically, the, the scroll that talks about um, your land or your service. They would make a scroll, they'd make a legal document, and on the outside of the scroll, 
On the inside, you would have all the, the legalese and all that kind of stuff stating what the land is and who you are and how long you're going to serve and all that kind of stuff. But the conditions to be redeemed were written on the outside of the scroll. And so when you have this passage, when it says, verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Well, how do they know that? And it would be the kind of thing where, again, you would have the conditions on the outside. So I'm going to go, uh, let's, let's flip this around. My brother's in, in, in Hawk, and I'm going to redeem him out of his slavery and redeem his land. What we would do is we would go get his scroll that had the terms, and I would take it before the elders, and they would read the conditions on the outside of the scroll, and I would say, I'm able to make payment for that, for that, for that scroll. And you see examples of this in, in the Bible. Here's, here's one, Jeremiah 32. Let me, let me go through and read this to you. Um, you can turn there if you, want, if you want to. Jeremiah 32, verses 10 through 15. Jeremiah, uh, God has Jeremiah go through a situation where he buys land. Uh, Israel's about to go into captivity. God has Jeremiah buy a piece of land as a promise that he's going to come back and his family is going to receive this. They're going to be gone for 70 years, but you are coming back was the point. So in verse 10, it says, I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open, and I gave the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, uh, son of Messiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witness who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Then I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this purchase deed which is sealed and this deed which is open, and put them in the earthen vessel, in an earthen vessel, that they may last for many days. Um, and uh, again, this is an example of that, that whole type of situation. And so, in, again, in the laws of redemption, you had this situation where you had to redeem your brother, if you could. And so the references for that are Leviticus 25, 25 through 28, also uh, Leviticus 25, 39 through 42, and 47 through 49. Actually, you know what, that would, it would be worth going through and reading it. I know that I just did the overview, but, you know, getting it in your, in your eye gate is a pretty good thing. Turn over to Leviticus 25, let's, and let's go through and read it real quick. In verse 25, it says, If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Or if the man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, then let him count the years since its sale, and restore the remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. In verse 28, but if he's not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall be released. That's the 50th year, and he shall return to his possession. And so whether you're talking about possession of land or whether you're talking about possession of people, we're going we're gonna to see this a little bit later on. If you were going to redeem it, what was left in the lease period, you paid for to redeem it, okay? And when you look down at verse 39, if one of your brethren who dwells by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers. For they are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. And then if you look down at verse 47. Now if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner, close to you or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle, or his uncle's son may redeem him, or anyone who is near of kin to him and his family may redeem him, or if he's able, to, able, he may redeem himself. And then it goes on and gives specifics 
on that how on how that redemption is supposed to go. So again, description of the property and how it was lost was on the inside of the scroll. Um, if the conditions were not met, the property would remain in the hands of the landlord. And in the passage we're in, in Revelation chapter 5, it talks about redemption over and over again. And a Jew, picking up the book of Revelation, understanding this stuff out of the book of Leviticus, would go, that's a redemption scroll. That's a redemption scroll. And that's really interesting. Because what did Jesus redeem? Um, in, the, in the passage in Revelation chapter 5, uh, at the very beginning of the passage, it says, again, in, on, in verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that's the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then a strong, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Long time ago, I was teaching through Revelation, and, and uh, my wife came up to me after I was done with the study because you know, I didn't say much about the strong angel, and, you know, I, I mean, it flat out says it's a strong angel. And who would that be? And I don't know for sure who it would be, but the Bible talks about the fact that, uh, actually, we, we talked about that this morning. The, the Bible says that the God of this world, the God of this age, is blind to the minds of those who don't believe. Um, the, the Bible teaches that Satan has control over what's going on the earth. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but when Jesus was tempted, one of the things that Satan said to him was, if you'll bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. They'll be yours because they're mine to give to whom I will. And Jesus didn't say, no, they're not. The earth is the Lord's and all the fullness thereof. He didn't say that. What he said was, I'm not bowing down. Get behind me. You know, that, that whole thing. And so I wonder if the strong angel, actually my wife said this, um, I wonder if the strong angel isn't Satan. That would be an interesting tableau right there. Satan stands up and he points to the scroll and he goes, who's worthy to open the scroll? In other words, it's mine and you can't have it. Nobody's worthy to open the scroll. And so I think that uh, this scene surrounding the scroll uh, points to the fact that what we're talking about is the redemption scroll of the earth. Uh, no one found worthy to open it, uh, to even look at it. And John weeps over this whole thing because he knows the import. In the, in the book of Leviticus, what would happen is if you couldn't redeem, if you couldn't pay the price of redemption, what had been sold into slavery or sold into hawk had to stay with that master until the year of Jubilee. Um, I don't know that there's a year of Jubilee for the earth besides the fact that Jesus redeems us. And so if there was no redeemer, then this whole thing would be continuing as it is until the end of time, basically. So John weeps, and what happens is one of the elders comes up and begins comforting him. Verse 4, so I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll, open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's that? Yeah, it's Jesus. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He comes from Judah. Uh, the the uh, symbol for Judah was a lion, and um, it all points forward to Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. There are prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the fact that Jesus comes out of the lineage of David. Um, in fact, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about a, um, a branch that comes off the root of Jesse. And it's talking about the coming of Jesus. And so the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And then look at the, the next verse. It says, verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne. That's interesting. Because you remember what the throne looks like? What you have, what you have is you have a throne, and there's one who's sitting on the throne. But in chapter 4, nothing but light. All you see is light. And the light has a couple of different colors. One is bright white, and the other one is um, uh, like a sardius stone in appearance, which is, which is red. There's a rainbow about, around the throne, but there's red and white light that's coming off the throne. And out of the midst of that throne comes the lamb. That's pretty wild. So you got this light, and there's someone sitting on the throne because he's got the scroll in his hand. 
but you can't see him, right? And when the lamb is revealed, he comes out of the midst of that throne. That's kind of wild, right? That's, that's how I picture that, that whole progression in my head. And one of the things that you have in the Bible is the fact that when you're talking about God, you're not just talking about, well, we don't have three gods, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. We have one God in three persons. And Jesus said that I and the Father are one. And he was using an absolute unity when he was talking about that. We are one. Uh, at one point, one of the disciples said, just show us the Father and that'll suffice us. Just show us the Father. You know, it's like some, sometimes when the disciples said things, they were just so dumb. You know, Lord, just show us the Father and, and, and we'll be good with that. And Jesus goes, how long have I been with you, Philip? And he names the dude. How long have I been with you, Philip, and you don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father who sent me. And so Jesus and the Father are one in all kinds of ways. And this is one of those places in the Bible where you see it kind of, kind of pictured. And so again, in verse, verse 6, it says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. Remember, the four living creatures are around the throne. And in the midst of the elders, the elders are around them, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And so Jesus, when he is pictured as the one who can open the scroll, the elder lets him know that Jesus comes from the right family. He's the line of the tribe of Judah, and he comes from the root of David, because Messiah was always coming from the root of David. He was going to be um, one of the sons of David. Um, he also made the right price. Jesus is the sacrificed lamb. And so in this passage right here, you see Jesus pictured as, as a lamb as though it had been slain. You ever seen the killed animal? Have you ever seen a slain lamb? When I was in high school, I, uh, uh, I was in FFA, and I picked um, raising hogs because I watched how lambs were slain. And the way that they killed lambs was they walked up to them with a sharp knife and they slit their throats and they would sit there and go, bah, 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 you know, they're you know, making all kinds of noise until they bled out and they fell over dead. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. With a, with a pig, what happened was you walked up and you shot it in the head and the animal was done. I didn't like the way that they did lambs. And there were reasons for that and it had to do with the meat and all of that stuff, but it was a reason that I didn't want to do that. And after the, the lamb was slain, what you saw was a uh, lamb that was white uh, because they, they usually trim them right before uh, the fair. And uh, so, so they uh, trim the wool, a uh, lamb who's absolutely white and all around his neck. His neck would be laying open and there would be blood everywhere. That's a lamb that's been slain. Now, obviously, with Jesus, that's not what you're talking about. You're not talking about that literally, but it's a picture of the fact that Jesus still bears the marks of the crucifixion. Remember when Jesus was talking to the guys on the road to Emmaus, it's in the Gospel of Luke. These guys are walking out of Jerusalem because they're dejected, because Jesus has died on the cross, and they've heard that he's risen from the dead, but they don't believe it. And so Jesus goes out to get these guys, and he's walking along with them, and they don't recognize who he is. And they go, well, we had hoped that he was going to be the Messiah. And he goes, you know, foolish and slow of heart to believe. Um, how often does God have to deal with you? I'm paraphrasing here. And then the Bible says that he went to the scripture and he began showing them in all the places in the law and in the prophets where it said that the Messiah was going to die and rise again. And then he made like he was going to keep on going as they're walking along when they get to the place where they're going. And they said, no, 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 you need to come with us. And so they end up having dinner with him. And he sits down, and the way that they identified him was when he held up his hands and he broke the bread. And then as soon as that happened, he disappears, and they realize it was Jesus. Well, why, is there, why are his hands involved? What's that about? That's because he had holes in his hand. Remember Thomas? Thomas said, unless I can put my finger in the holes in his hand or put my fist into the hole in his side, I'm not going to believe that he's risen from the dead. And when Jesus appeared to Thomas, this is in John chapter 20, when Jesus appeared to Thomas, he goes, here I am. Fingers, let's go. You know, that kind of thing. Thomas didn't do it. He didn't walk up and go, well, let me check you out. Let me stick it. You know, he was talking big. And what he did was he hit his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. 
and he recognized that Jesus was who he was. Jesus still bore the marks of the crucifixion. There's this whole thing with Jesus after the resurrection where people aren't really sure about whether or not it's Jesus. And some people have said, well, maybe it's because he's in his glorified state and I don't know, he's shiny or something like that. But you remember what the Bible says happened to him before he went to the cross? They, they beat him up. They, they lacerated his back. His back had to be like hamburger. The Bible says that they punched him in the face. In the Old Testament, it, talks, it prophesies about the fact that they plucked his beard out. And I don't, you know, you ladies don't know anything about this, but a guy who has a beard, man, you get, you get in a fight with a beard, that's a handle, you know? And so they plucked his beard out. They went, yanked it out, and they're punching him in the head. They're putting a bag over his head and punching him. And after you get done with a situation like that, you're not going to look good. And there could have been all kinds of problems that were there, including busted bones in his face and that kind of thing. The Romans were not gentle with somebody who was going to a cross. And so after the resurrection, we see Jesus still bearing the marks of the crucifixion. And I wonder if that whole thing with the recognition of who Jesus was has had to do with how beat up he was after the cross. So what, what would the reason be that Jesus would continue to bear the marks of the crucifixion? Why would, why would the Lord do that? Why does it, you know, after Jesus dies on the cross and rises again from the dead, why don't we just make him all new and all clean and all pretty and, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff? Why don't we do that? And I really think that the reason that you see Jesus in heaven pictured as a lamb as though it had been slain is so that we always remember how we got there. We always understand what, what Jesus did for us. I don't think it's a guilt thing. I think it's a love thing. This is how much I love you. This is what I've done for you. I got holes in my hands that tell you how much I love you. I got holes in my feet that show you how much I love you. Look at my face. This is how much I love you. And I think that's cool. So he's the lamb as though he had been slain. When it talks about seven horns, horns are a symbol of power. What, what is seven a symbol of? Completeness, complete power. When it says seven eyes, um, uh, eyes are obviously a picture of seeing. And when you have seven connected with that, that means all seeing. He's got complete power. He's all powerful. He's got uh, complete sight. He's all seeing. And it uh, 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 connects this with the seven spirits of God that are sent out into all the earth. And we talked about that in chapter four. So I won't go over that again. So I think it's the redemption scroll. I think it's the title deed to the earth and mankind. I think that the reason that God put the laws of redemption in the book of Leviticus is because there was a, re a bigger redemption coming that didn't just include poor people in the land of Israel. It was a bigger redemption that had to do with you and with me and with all of the creation. You know, when you, when you go in the Bible, in the Old Testament, um, earth was given to whom? You guys know? Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So everything on the earth was given to mankind in Genesis chapter 1, verse, in, in verse 28. Um, at the fall, one of the things that happened was that the earth was lost. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, it says this, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Um, in, in, I've, I've already referenced this verse. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan is a god of this world, whose minds, the god of this age. The word for age there is also a word that um, can be translated world. It's the age, it's the world, it's, it's that whole thing. It's, it's a Greek term that includes both of those things. Whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus, uh, the Bible teaches in Luke 4, 6 through 7, that Satan was given control over the kingdoms of the earth. And I already referenced that. And so that's the passage. Jesus is standing before Satan. Satan knows why Jesus has come. The reason that Jesus has come is because he's come to gain back 
that which was lost in the fall. And what was lost in the fall was all the kingdoms of the earth. Every person on this planet was lost in the fall. And so Jesus comes to gain that back, and Satan goes, I'll give you a shortcut. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. You don't have to pay the price. I know what the price is, Jesus. You don't have to pay all that. If you'll just bow down just this once, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. We'll call it done. And it's the ultimate act of arrogance. It's the ultimate act of, of spitefulness. Satan, for one moment, wanted to actually have God bowing before him. Remember that the reason that Satan fell was because he wanted to replace God. And when Jesus comes down to the earth, what you've got is God in human form. God has made himself accessible, not only to us, but to Satan himself. And he says, if you'll just bow down, just do it, bow down, I'll give it all to you. And we can stop right here. And again, Jesus wouldn't. You're only to serve, serve and worship the Lord your God, is what Jesus said, quoting from the Old Testament. And so you have this whole, this whole situation with the, um, the slavery of mankind. When Adam and Eve, um, the Bible talks about this in, Rev, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 5, when one man sinned, he took all men and he brought them down with him. And Adam is our federal head. So when Adam sins, what he does is he makes himself available to Satan. He makes himself, what he, basically what they had a choice of was, am I going to obey God or am I going to obey Satan? And as it says in Romans chapter 6, um, you become one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of righteousness leading to eternal life. And so what they did was they chose obeying Satan in that passage. At that point, they become slaves of Satan. If you're a slave, you lose everything, including the world. And that's what happened at the fall. That's how intense this whole thing is. And when you're talking about the, the creation that was given over, one of the things that the Bible teaches is that when the creation was given over, corruption entered into the creation. And when you look at corruption, it's the idea of decay. When you look at the, the decay, we're used to that all around us. And so second law of thermodynamics, everything breaks up, everything breaks down, that kind of thing. There has to be some aspect of that you know, going on, or otherwise you couldn't walk on on anything. You'd just be slipping around. But in any case, the whole idea of decay, things falling apart, is something that's universal. It's not just something that happens on the earth. It's something that happens on Mars. It's something that happens on the sun. It's something that happens on the moon. It happens on every star that we see out in the universe. It happens everywhere that we look in the galaxy. And so when you're talking about the fall, it's not just the fall of earth. As far as decay goes, it's the fall of everything. And when you're in Romans chapter 8, it talks about the whole creation is groaning and in travail up until now, waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. In, in other words, when we get redeemed, when we finally um, get to stand before God, what's going to happen is everything is going to be made right. The whole universe is going to be made right. That's, that's the implications of these things. Adam and Eve had no idea what the implications were in the sense that what they were losing and what was, what was going to happen with this, because they're new. They're brand new. They don't know everything that's going on. And they obviously did not understand the, the pain and the suffering and all the garbage that was going to go on for decades, for eons, after they fell to this whole thing. But the fall happened, and we're in the midst of that whole thing. There was a price that God said was going to be paid if they did not do what he said uh, about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everybody makes mistakes on that. And, and a lot of times what guys will do is when they do the whole story of Adam and Eve, they'll say, well, God didn't want them to go to the tree of knowledge. Nonsense. It's not the tree of knowledge. Actually, what God had said to Adam was, I want you to tend the garden and I want you to keep it. And the phrasing that you have there in Hebrew has the idea of, I want you to go and discover its secrets. Adam had an awesome job. Look at what I've made for you, Adam. God says, I want you to take care of it, and I want you to discover all its secrets. God wasn't keeping knowledge from anyone. He was keeping the knowledge of evil from them. And the only way that they were going to understand evil is if they disobeyed God, which means that the fruit is not magic. 
It's not magic fruit that was going to change everything. It was the obedience or the disobedience that was going to change everything. The fruit on that tree, you know, the Bible never says it was an apple. That's something that came from the Middle Ages. And so we don't know what the fruit on the tree was. And so it could have been a banana, you know, it could have been an avocado, you know, it could have been something like that. The Jews said it was a pomegranate. I believe them. That's a God thing. Can you, have you ever eaten a pomegranate? You have to work at a pomegranate. So if you're going to, we used to have a pomegranate tree when I was a kid. And so you went and got a pomegranate. You didn't just bite into a pomegranate. You had to, you had to bite into it and rip the peel off. And, you know, you're doing all this stuff to get into it. And I really think that the Jews are probably right on that whole thing. Because Eve, when she's doing this whole thing, has to work at it. It's not just a, you know, kind of thing where you just kind of go, uh -huh. oh, oops. I bit into the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And then, you know, it's like, you have to do this. You have to be determined. And the same thing with Adam. In any case, as soon as they do that, they know evil. And God said, in the day that you eat from that tree, dying, you will die. It's literally what it says in Hebrew. You're not going to die instantly. You're not going to fall over dead. But dying, you will die. And that was the price. Dying, you shall die. When you look at the, the qualifications for a redeemer, and this is where this whole thing gets cool. Qualifications for a redeemer was that it had to be a close relative had to be a man, had to be somebody who was not in slavery, someone who could pay the price, and someone who was willing. And in this passage, when you look at verse 3, it says, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to meet the qualifications. They couldn't pay the price or they weren't uh, uh, part of the redemptive family. And again, this is, this is how this whole thing works. It's the idea of um, if I'm going to be redeemed, I have to go to my brother. He's my closest relative. If he can't do it, then I go to the next closest relative. If they can't do it, I go to the next closest relative and on down the line until I can find somebody who can actually redeem me. Well, here's a problem that we've got. The redemption of our souls is something that, that uh, ha carries the penalty of death on it. The only way that you can redeem somebody from their sin is for the, the price to be paid and the price is death. And here's the problem with me and my brother. See, my brother gets sold into slavery. And he goes in, in, into this kind of slavery. And he goes, can you pay the price? And I go, what's the price? Well, the price is your death. Well, okay, I can die for you. But is there any other qualifications? Yeah, qualification is you cannot be a sinner. You can't be in slavery yourself. And so the problem with me redeeming my brother out of his sin is that he's in slavery to sin, but guess what? So am I. So are my sisters. So are my parents. And my parents' parents. And my parents' parents' parents. All the way down to Adam and Eve. Everybody is in slavery. And when you're in slavery, you can't redeem anybody. You can't even redeem yourself. And there are passages that you'll run, a, run across in the Bible that speak about this whole thing. So when you're looking at the qualifications, he has to be somebody who is a, re a close relative. So when, when we're looking at the qualifications for redemption of everybody on the planet and the universe, when we're looking at, for those qualifications, we can go through the whole human race. And all the way through the human race, you're not going to find anyone all the way back to Adam, except for one guy. And it's Jesus. And here's the deal with this. You can't, you can't get ahead of yourself on this whole thing, um, because when you're talking about redemption, redemption started when Jesus came along. That's 2,000 years ago. And so we're, the, we're on the other end of this whole thing. So basically, you got all this history before Jesus. Jesus comes in, redeems everything. Then we got, got all these people after Jesus that need to be redeemed also. And his redemption back then takes care of all this stuff. But when you're back at the time of Jesus, what you have is Jesus comes along, no one before him can do anything about the redemption of mankind. And it has to be him. You follow what I'm saying? Here's the reason I'm saying this. Because when you go back in the history of, of, of Jesus' ancestry, and you look at everyone who came before him, everyone who came before him is a sinner, all the way down to Adam. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along, and he's able to pay the price? How does that work? He just shows up, and boom, here we are. Is he a close relative of the human race? Is Jesus a close relative of the human race? If he's going to be the redeemer, he has to be that before he comes, not after he comes. He has to be that before he comes. And this is what's important about that. 
when you go down through all of the people who, who have the opportunity to redeem mankind, if they were perfect, if they could pay the price, if they weren't sold into slavery, you got all the families of mankind all the way down to Adam and nobody can fulfill that. So are there any other relatives of mankind when you go back to Adam? Any other relatives? Anybody who's related to mankind before Adam? Anybody? Who, who was Adam made in the image of? God. So we've just taken all the human race, we've negated every one of them as being able to do the redemption, and the only other relative, after you go through the whole family of the human race, that the human race has is God. So the only one who can redeem us is God, because he's the nearest relative. Jesus has to be God, otherwise you're not redeemed. And so again, when you look at Jesus coming out of the midst of the throne and that whole thing, that's what's going on with that. He has to be a man too. There's a lineage that's pointed to in the Old Testament. And the Redeemer was going to come from Abraham. And he then from Abraham, he was going to come from Isaac. And then from Isaac, he was going to come from Judah. And from Judah, he was going to come from the line of David. And so there's a lineage that has to be fulfilled. And Jesus is from the line of David. And those are prophecies that God laid down in the Old Testament. So two things that we've got right now as far as the identification of the Redeemer. He has to be God, otherwise nobody's redeemed. And he has to be from the line of David, from the line of Judah, from the line of Isaac, from the line of Abraham, from the line of Noah, from the line of Seth. All the way down, all the way down to the end. And both Mary and Joseph are in the line of David. He has to be without sin. Um, God made him, this is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for he, had, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, and Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Uh, 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus over and over is called the one who is without sin. When you get to the price of redemption, you had to pay the price and it had to be something that was done willingly. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, it says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with cor corruptible things, like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, what he's doing is he's paying the price for our sin, which is death. And he has to be somebody who's not a slave himself. And so he has to be without sin. He has to be from the right family, the family of David, and he has to be God himself. All those things are required for the redemption of mankind. Hebrews 12, 2 says that we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The idea, again, being that Jesus is in connection with the Father. Revelation, again, 5, 6, talks about the fact that the marks of the crucifixion are still on Christ. He's paid the price, and you can see it. You can see it. All that is way cool. And so when Jesus appears and he takes the scroll out of the hand of the Father, all of creation starts rejoicing over, over this whole thing. Again, it's a big fat deal. All of creation begins rejoicing over this whole thing because it is not going to end the way that it is right now. What we have now, even though, you know, I like my life, I like, I like the, the planet at least, I don't want it, like a lot of things that are going on on the planet, but I like the planet at least. There's, there's cool things about this, but it's still fallen and it's still messed up in all kinds of ways. And what God's going to do is he's going to come along and he's going to fix it all. And so the price has been paid 2,000 years ago. The world is in escrow at this point. You know how that works. You pay the price for your home. There's a period of time where you're in escrow and then you finally get to move in. And the book of Revelation is about the, about the end of the escrow period. Jesus is about to come and he's about to take uh, control. He's about to take um, ownership of the planet, of all of the creation. And the, um, the people who are dwelling here, who are basically, um, what do you call that when you 
you hang out in somebody's house you're not supposed to be there? What is it? Squatting. squatting. You've got a bunch of people squatting on the planet. And Jesus is going to come in and he's going to kick out the squatters and in we come. So let's read the rest of this and we'll, we'll end it up. It says, Now when he had taken the scroll, verse 8, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song, saying, You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation that identifies who the 24 elders are, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And that's what's going to happen with you and with me. We've been redeemed out of every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And Jesus is going to make us kings and priests, and we're going to reign with him on the earth, just like it says in this passage. Then I looked, and not only are the 24 elders representing the church praising God, it says, I looked, and, uh, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Um, millions is what's being spoken about there, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So everyone in heaven is rejoicing. The angels have been watching us for a very long time. The angels, the Bible says, are looking at the church, and the church is a school for angels. This is out of the book of Ephesians. God's showing uh, the angels his grace through you and through me. Basically, the, uh, the Jews believe that the reason that Satan fell was because God made Adam out of dirt and then told the angels that you were made to serve this. And so you can see the picture there. Satan going, I'm not serving dirt. I'm not serving something made out of dust. I'm the highest of your creation. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rule. I'm not going to serve. And that's why Satan fell. Um, according to Jewish tradition. That's really interesting because later on, what we have is the angels are looking at the church and the Bible says in, also in 1 Peter that the angels are looking at the church and they, they seriously like looking into the things of salvation. They like watching you and seeing what Jesus does with you as he changes you over time from somebody who was just lost and messed up in the world and he begins forming you into something that is just amazing and finally he's going to end up glorifying you and taking you um, home to be with the Father. And the angels are watching this, and they seriously like looking into these things. So angels have been watching for a long time. I think that when angels watch me, um, you know, I, it, it kind of embarrasses me. I, you know, people have spoken to me and said, you know, when I get to heaven, I, I, you know, I know that there's supposed to be angels watching me. I'm going to have a talk with them. Because I, I think they fell down on the job a number of times. You know, that kind of thing. And I've, I've never been like that. You know, if angels are watching me all the time, that means they're watching me all the time. They're seeing every stupid thing that I do, every ridiculous thing that I get myself into, every stupid thought, every stupid action. I don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to stand before an angel and just go, hey, what's up? What, are you, what, what was up with you? And the angel turns, back, turns right back around on me and goes, what are you talking about? What was up with you? Remember when you did this? Remember when you did this? You always did this thing when you were all alone. You know, that was kind of weird. You're a really strange guy. You know, you always got your finger in your nose. You always got your finger in your ear. What are you doing, man? You know, I, I don't want to have that conversation with an angel. You know, there's way too much stupidity in Steve Winery to have that kind of thing going on. I think that the school that God's using with angels is God going, look at what I can do with dirt. Look at what I can do with dirt. I think that was pretty cool. Because what he's going to do is take the dirt. He's going to redeem it. He's going to bless it. He's going to make it something new. He's going to bring it to heaven. And he's going to make it the ruler over all creation. That's what the Bible says he's going to do with you. That's what he does with dirt. And the angels sit back and go, whoa, amazing. Here's another thing about angels. They see God all the time. They see him face to face. I don't. You don't. We're serving God. We don't see him. And I think that if I was an angel, I was sitting there watching us. You know, there are times when uh, people um, who are believers are just exhibiting amazing acts of faith, amazing acts of trust without seeing the person that they're exercising faith in or seeing the person that they're trusting in. 
and we have joy, and we have love for him, and we've never seen him. We're not like the apostles. The apostles at least had seen Jesus. We've never seen him, and we still serve him like that. I think angels are sitting there going, you know, it's right that you're doing that, and you have no idea how worthy he is of your worship and your honor and your praise. You have no idea that he's worthy of that, and yet you're doing it, and you don't even see him, and we do. I think angels are kind of blown away over that. And so when this finally happens, when this whole redemption thing takes place and Jesus takes a scroll, all the angels erupt into praise because what they're seeing is the finality of what God began at the very start of the creation. When you're going through Revelation, we lost it all in Genesis, we get it back in Revelation. And we get it back because of Jesus. And then finally, verse 13, it says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying. Okay, this is hope for you who want your dogs to be in heaven or your horse. Your cat, I don't think it's going to (laughs) happen. I I like cats too. I always pick on cats, but I like them. Actually, the word for creation in this passage is created thing. It's used a number of times. 1 Timothy 4.4, it's used of animals. Um, It says, uh, talking about food, for every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. In James 1.18, it talks about us along with the creation. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so we are part of that creation. So animals and us are, are called created things. And then in Revelation 8, 9, um, it talks about sea life. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed, Revelation 8, 9. Um, and so you have the, this term that's used of animals and sea life. And so when I first went through and read that, I went, okay, everything that's in, in heaven, everything that's on the earth, everything that's under the earth, and I'm, I'm going people who, have, who are in heaven, people who are on the earth, people who have died, and everything that's in the sea. And that's where I had a problem because they are in the sea. It's not like they're just dead. They are in the sea. And so I kind of think it's talking about animals. And so you have the whole creation praising, all of the creation. So not only the angels, not only mankind, mankind's been praising earlier, but you have all the, all the creation praising. Isn't that weird? You know, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, serpents talking, they're not having a problem. Isn't that weird? Why are they not having a problem? And I wonder if, it, if there wasn't a communication that, that was normal for them. And again, they're new. They don't know everything. And Satan is disguising himself. But I wonder if there was some aspect of being able to understand what was going on with the, with the creation in a way that we don't have anymore. You know, they've, this isn't actually, you know, true, true. But they say that we use a, a tenth of our brain. That's the thing that they say. But we're not using all our brain power. And you can tell that when you get what's called an idiot savant. This is a technical term. Somebody who has a problem, sometimes it, it, it has to do with genetics and that kind of thing. But you have somebody who cannot function in society and yet is a genius as far as math goes. Rain Man, if you ever watch that movie. Or is a genius as far as music goes. And so they can sit down and they can literally hear, and, you know, hear uh, something you know, that, uh, that was played by Beethoven or, or Mozart. And they can hear it one time, sit down at a piano and, and start playing it. That's the kind of potential you have in your brain. And so we, we've, we're falling a long ways. And it looks like that's what it used to be like. I wonder if some of that potential didn't have to do with the rest of creation too and being able to understand them. And so I don't know that. I don't know that for sure. I know that my dog makes his, it makes his will known to me routinely by wagging his tail, jumping around in certain areas, that kind of, he's communicating with me. And I don't know if they can communicate more. But anyway, the Bible talks about the whole creation rising up in praise. There's a passage in Ecclesiastes 3.21, I'm gonna end with this, that says, who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward and the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth. And when I first read that, I used that to prove to people that dogs don't go to heaven, they just go into, go into the earth. 
But then later on, I found out that that could be translated in another way, and this is how it can be translated. Who knows if the spirit of man rises upwards and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. In other words, we don't know where the spirit of animals go. And we do know that there are, there are animals connected with heaven. We're riding back on horses. So at least my horse is going to make it. <laughs> and so we're riding back on horses. I, um, I'm pretty sure my dogs are going to make it because they're just wonderful. They think I'm the best thing going. And so that's got to get them into heaven, right? I got a sign on my, on my wall that says, God, make me the kind of man my, that my dog already thinks I am. <laughs> it's absolutely true. So anyway, if, you, if you're hoping for your dogs being in heaven or your cats or your hamster or your little birds or whatever, there, there's, your, there's your backup in Revelation chapter 5. Let's pray. I know I'm light. Let's get you out of here. Thanks, God, for your word. Thanks, God, for the promise of redemption. Thanks, God, for the fact that you've already paid the price for us. And there's coming a day when, when we're, going to, we're going to be with you. We're going, to, we're going to see these things done. And there's going to be a time when we're going to be with all of heaven praising you over the fact that you've paid the price for us, that you've made a way for us to, to gain eternity, to gain heaven, to gain eternal life. And you did it for everyone. It's just sad that not everyone wants to go. Um, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to, to walk in that assurance, walk in that, in that glory, Lord, of the fact that you've done everything uh, to turn this whole, un not just the world, but the whole universe around. And you're going to make it all new. And it's a cool thing. Lord, we're looking forward to the day. I uh, just pray that you bless your people, that you go with them now, and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.